Blog Talk Radio. This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to be here with us. And also thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling at N5D.com for making this show possible. With humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and our collective reality, we have plenty of subject material. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and had the honor and privilege of working with her and alongside of her for several years. You can find out more about my practice of QHHT and my consulting and coaching services at newearthjourney.com. And you can also contact me about a brand new session and process I'm offering remotely. Call or email about how we can create your own unique quantum healing process. And lastly, before we get started tonight, for those of you looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method of QHHT, you may find a wonderful listing, photo listing, of the people around the world who are practicing at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. Also, if you would like to participate live on the show tonight, you can either join us in the chat room or you can call this phone number in the United States, 646-716-8890. That's 646-716-8890. And I believe that number works for our Canadian friends as well. And we're going to try to answer as many of those calls as possible. Tonight is December 11th. 2015. And this is going to be a very fun show. I have known my friend Jeroen. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Jeroen, he says to use your uvula when you say that. So I, although I have read that name for many years, I'm still practicing saying it. <laughs> Wonderful name. Jeroen DeWitt for more than seven years. We haven't had the pleasure of being in the same room at the same time, but maybe someday that'll happen. He's one of the kindest and most heart-loving people I've ever known and a wonderful QHHT practitioner. His strange looking and sounding name is actually a very common name in his country of origin, the Netherlands. And this is where he started his journey in exploring consciousness when he was first introduced in 1997 to a meditation technique developed by gifted psychic Reva LaRue. And it opened him up to different layers of his being and helped him manage his energy and be more grounded in his body and on our beautiful earth. He continued his exploration of consciousness and that led him to study dance and bioenergetics. And he earned a BA in art therapy and MA in spiritual psychology. He's also a certified Reiki and, of course, quantum healing, hypnosis 
therapy practitioner. He does EMF balancing, and he's also a quantum touch practitioner. Hey, so am I. Your own studied with Dolores Cannon in 2006, which is actually even before I did. And he has since regressed hundreds of people. And he now teaches energy medicine tools and processes for empowerment and facilitates past life exploration and meditation and leads meditation groups throughout the Los Angeles area. And he has over 3,000 hours of experience studying healing and therapeutic techniques, doing therapeutic work with individuals and groups in the Los Angeles area. And today's show is going to focus on a very special session that your own and I believe, I think he had sometimes in early 2014. But before we start talking about that, I would like to say welcome to my dear friend, Hello, you're on. Hi, are I'm you? here. How are you? I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> now, oh. you, uh, you, you ran yourself down to a Starbucks to get a good signal. Is that what you did? <laughs> I did, yeah. There was, we just had some technical difficulties, and hopefully the sound is coming in clear. I can hear you fine right now. How, how about, can I, you hear me? I can hear you very well, and I'm, I'm very glad that we... Um, that we chose this way to connect because this is the best sound sounding audio that that we've tried so uh so welcome and sit back and get ready to to chat about all of these amazing things that we that we're going to talk about tonight and you know we're going to talk about this amazing session that you had with a a lady named kathy bird about her son um claiming to be baseball player Lou Gehrig, and we're going to talk about that here shortly, but but actually I'd just like to start a little bit by you telling our audience how you got started in all of this, how you learned about Dolores, where you studied with her, et cetera. Will you give us a little background, please? Sure, I'd love to. First of all, thank you for that introduction you just gave me. That was very kind. Um, <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I'm so excited to be on the show. So I'm from the Netherlands. Maybe you can detect a little accent. Um, I've been in the <laughs> States since 2007, and I started with Dolores back in 2006. Um, I found her because um, I'd say as a kid, I was always looking for, you know, the unseen, the magic behind the physical world. I had, I had the sense that there was more to life than, you know, just the physical world reality that I was seeing um, around me. And... Um, so I was always interested in the metaphysical, and um, I remember reading a book about um, out-of-body experiences when I was like eight years old, and it really sparked my interest. I thought, oh, okay, this this man is onto something. I, I think his name was Nelson Monroe of the Monroe Institute that wrote that book. Um, and so <clears throat> I think it was in 2006, I was visiting a friend, and he had some books laying around. And at that time, I wasn't reading as much because I was in school and I had to read for school a lot, so I, I wasn't reading, you know, just for leisure. But I picked up this book that looked interesting, and it had the, um, it said custodians, and it had this picture of an alien on it, and uh, the name said Dolores Cannon. I'd never heard of her before that, so I started reading, and, you know, she has a little introduction about what she does, and my interest was sparked. I was just locked on target. I just devoured the whole book, um, I, it made so much sense to me and I was like, oh my God, finally, um, you know, a a book that describes experiences of of worlds that I've, you know, thought of or that I hoped would exist. And this is somebody who sort of reports from those realms. I was so interested. So I think um, I started reading more of her books and then I looked up her website and lo and behold, she was going to come to the Netherlands that year, 2006. Um, at that at that time, you had to be a hypnotherapist in order to take her course. But when I called in, mm-hmm. they had just sort of uh, changed the requirements that you just had to have experience in working with people for about a year prior to taking her class. And I was currently training to be an art therapist, um, and I had you know done therapeutic work for people already, so I was good to go. So she came to the Netherlands in The Hague in 2006. 
And um, so I went, I took the class, and I was just mesmerized by, you know, the knowledge that she had and the stories that, stories, the stories that she would tell. Um, it was just really, I don't know, I just felt the energy that she just brought with her, and it was just, um, I, just I was just magnetized. It was attracted to it. It was, it was so interesting, and um, you know, I I couldn't wait to start practicing after after the course. And first, my my friends you know volunteered, and then I started working uh, professionally and doing sessions on people. How many people were in that class in 2006? And would you tell you know, I mean just a little bit about like kind of where it was and what that was like? Was there a translator? I mean, give us a little flavor of what that was like. Okay, so um, so I was at The Hague in a uh, little room above, like, an international um, bookstore, and um, there wasn't a translator. I think it was mentioned that the class was going to be in English, and so I remember there was a guy from Norway, and there was a guy, no, a woman from France. Um, so it was a bit of an international mix of people, so the, the language was English, and... Um, mm-hmm. I think there were about 12 of us. I don't quite remember. It was a bit of a rowdy class. It was a lot of, you know, <laughs> talking and <laughs> people were talking amongst each other. And, and when I when I met Dolores back in 2009 when I did Level 2 in Burbank, she, she remembered that class and she she was concerned because she thought nobody got the information since there was so much talking going on. But, yeah, I, I, I did get it, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's, that's really that's, interesting, that's what, you know. Dolores always had a um, kind of a quirk about her that it, it was hard for her, especially with, you know, her hearing. Uh, it, it was a little hard for her sometimes to make out people when they had a bit of an accent. Did you find that to be the case at that time? Um, I was wondering about that because I remember looking at her while the sort of the cross talking was going on and she you know, you probably know her expressions a little bit better, but I thought she looked perturbed <laughs> at certain times. <laughs> you know, she had that sort of raised eyebrow, like, you know, what's going on here, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah, and and so, sometimes she did not understand the questions because, because the accent was a little, a little thick, yeah. Yeah. And people would have to well, repeat themselves. Well, Thank you for uh, for giving us a little bit of, of background about how you found out about Dolores. And, you know, I have to say that the way that you describe that about your reaction picking up her books, you know, most of us as practitioners feel that way. And many, many of her clients and our own clients who come to see us uh, have that reaction. They pick up her books or listen to her on YouTube, and and it's that exact same thing. It's like finally, finally, yes. somebody kind of has brought it all together, and uh, and it makes some sense internally. There's you know there's a there's a connection and a, a sense in inside of us that that what she's speaking is is important and is about as close to the truth as you know anything that's ever been talked about or written, etc. So, so thanks for that, but let's jump right into the amazing story. And by the way, um, I, I do see Kathy on the line, so Kathy, we'll get to you here uh, pretty quick. Thank you so much for holding. Uh, I want to give uh, you a, um, a, a chance to kind of tell us how this all started. How did you meet Kathy? What was it like when you first started talking to her? And kind of give us some background about this amazing session about, you know, Lou Gehrig that that you're going to tell us about. How did it all start? Sure. So she was referred to me by a friend of hers that had done a session with me. And so she called me and we talked on the phone and she started telling me about her her son who started telling her when he was I think only three years old that he used to be a tall German baseball player and she she was raised in church and she had no context for reincarnation a past life she had no idea so um at first she told me that she tried to correct his his grammar saying oh you want to be a tall baseball player you know (laughs) and And German And and Germany, yeah, a little off, right? (laughs) But, um, 
yeah, where did he get that information? So um, I think more and more details sort of spilled out this little kid that, you know, it was so detailed. And, you know, and a three-year-old doesn't go to the computer and start Googling, you know, he doesn't know how to use, you know, type in words and stuff. So um, mm-hmm. all these details started spilling out. So she was, um, I think she was a little alarmed in the beginning, like, what is going on with my kid? And so she had taken him to her pastor in church and, you know, the pastor, the poor guy, didn't know what to do with it. He told her to um, to get an exorcism, actually. <laughs> he thought no, goodness. Boy was, yeah, the little boy was demon-possessed is what he thought. So uh, she said, you know, hold up, just let me try something else first. And so she was kind of forced to look outside of her known, you know, her known environment. And um, And at one point, you know, she found out about past life regression. And um, at that time, she her kid started telling her so many details that um, what what she was telling her it pointed towards that he had had a life as the baseball player Lou Gehrig because he was talking about his friend Babe Ruth and that they had a fallout. Um, so you know she, she knew about that name and she she's a very avid researcher so she kind of put one of them together. So finally, she was ready to come see me. So she made the appointment and she came in. And um, that's when the amazing story, you know, unfolded. Well, I guess that probably brings us right to where we should welcome Kathy to the show. So I'm going to unmute your microphone right now, Kathy, and welcome you to Quantum Healing with Candace. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Candace, and thank you, your own. <laughs> for having me. It's, it's so wonderful that that you are coming forth with your name and this story. So many people, other people have some similar stories and they stay very much hidden underground because of uh backlash or worry about how other people will um you know take the the kind of you know presentation of these ideas and i just want to commend you and um and honor you for you know talking about what's actually happening in your life um it's it's quite brave of you and it makes in my in my opinion it makes the world a much better place so i just want to start off by thanking you so much oh thank you for that this did take me about how long has it been? At least three and a half years to really decide to share this with the world. Well, I can see why. Yeah, it has been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what um, what is your um, you know, how would you like to expand on what your own already uh, told us? Is there anything that that you would like to talk about? Like, you know, what was going yeah. on through through your mind and what other people saw and what they said and all of that. Yeah, you know what I can do is I'll give you a quick rundown on how, you know, this came to our attention. Um, We had a little boy who was obsessed with baseball, like since the age of two, and he was born into a family with no affinity for baseball. In fact, his father (laughs) is German and never played before. So we were a little bit confused by it from the very beginning. Um, I took a video of him when he was two years old and put it on YouTube. And a couple weeks later, we got an email from Adam Sandler saying that they were desperately searching for this kid to be in a movie. Um, And it was the movie, That's My Boy. And a couple weeks later, we ended up on an airplane to Boston where we filmed the movie. And he had a baseball playing cameo role in the movie. Um, and, and he just had this very um, this aptitude for baseball that was very uncharacteristic of a two-year-old. Um, and what they did in the movie, they digitized him, and they, they made him look better than the adults and made it funny that he was so young. Um, and while we were in Boston, I took him to a baseball game. It was his second baseball game that he'd ever been to, and he'd never watched baseball on television. And it happened to be at Fenway Park, which is the big baseball stadium in Boston, (laughs) Yeah, which is a big one. Um, And it was the Yankees playing the Red Sox. Um, And he had been to one Dodger game before that. So um, he sees a big picture of Babe Ruth on the wall, and he got very, very upset. 
and and said, Mommy, I don't like him. He was mean to me. And it was strange, like, to see your toddler, you know, having a fit over this big poster. But it really, he was so upset by it that we actually had to leave the stadium. We I had bought these tickets that were, like, $300, and we didn't even get to really oh watch the gosh. game because he was so worked up about this. Um, so this was kind of, like, the first clues um, he had some conversations with Adam Sandler where Adam, you know, was holding him and he said, oh, you're going to get me tickets when you get older and what team are you going to play for? And he tells Adam, I play Yankees, you know. So he, there were little hints there on that trip, but when we came home is when he really dove into, like, insisting that he used to be a tall baseball player. And as Jerome was saying, I would correct him and he would say, no, Mommy, I was tall. I was tall like Daddy. You know, and so finally I started listening. Um, and the one thing that really got my attention and my husband's attention was we were in an elevator one day, and he had just turned three years old and at this time still didn't watch television, didn't read. Um, and we're in an elevator, and he says, Mommy, this elevator kind of reminds me of a hotel. Yeah. And we said, yeah, kind of. And he said, when I was a tall baseball player, when I was tall like Daddy, I used to stay in hotels almost every night. And so we kind of looked at each other like, okay. And then I said, well, did you fly on airplanes? And he, and then he looks at us and he says, no, mostly trains. You know, and so we looked oh at my God. and we're like, wow, Babe Ruth traveled on trains. You know, like every time he would look something up that he would say, it would be correct. Like he would say things like, mommy, when I played baseball, we only played our games during the day because there were no lights on the fields. And we'd look it up and there were no lights until the 1940s. And then just every wow. single thing that he would do would prove to be correct. And so finally, I originally reached out to Carol Bowman, who wrote a story. She's written a book on children's past lives. And she, mm-hmm. this kind of ties into what you were saying about wanting to stay private. She has a blog. She has like a forum where parents write about their kids' experiences. And I was really reluctant to do that. I just didn't really want to, you know, make a big deal about this. And partially because our son has kind of a big following on the Internet, like he's got 7 million views on YouTube for his baseball. And he's got, you know, like Fox Sports has written articles on him. But we've never, ever, ever mentioned anything about these past life memories that he shared with us. So it was kind of a scary thing because he is kind of like already publicly out there. Um, It was even more scary, you know, because if we come out with our story, then people know right where to find him. Um, But what we did do when he turned five, we had Dr. Tucker, who is, um, he's from the University of Virginia. He's um, an associate professor of psychiatry and neurobehavioral sciences, and he heads the Division of Perceptual Studies um, that was originally founded by Dr. Dr. Ian Stevenson in 1967. And so Dr. Um, Tucker and Dr. Stevenson have, have accumulated 2,500 cases of these children these children between the ages of three to about six um, that have these past life memories, like children from all over the world. Um, and so he came to our house um, shortly before I met Jerome. He, Jerome, he came to our house um, in February of 2014, and he interviewed Christian. Our son's name is Christian. And while he was here, my son said to Dr. Tucker, he said, well, I chose her to be my mother, and then she got old. And and, bo- and I was shocked because my son had never said anything about choosing me to be his mother or anything like this. And then we asked him, you know, well, he asked, where were you when you chose her? And he said, in the sky. And then um, And then I asked, well, when did you choose me? And he said, well, when you were born. And then just as I... You know, I asked him then, I said, well, what happened in between? Because I was 41 when he was born, so I wanted to hear, like, what's heaven like? You know, like, what happened between the time you picked me and the time you were born? And he said, well, oh, I don't remember that. And Mm -hmm. just as I thought that he was making this up, Dr. Tucker said that many, many, many of these children, like a high percentage of these children that come in bearing these past life memories, recall choosing their parents. And many times they can tell you, like, exactly where they were and where the parents were when they chose them. So this was all very new to me. <laughs> was, um, and the, and what led me to your own and the regressions was when Dr. Tucker was leaving our house, I thanked him, and it was, you know, it was a very enlightening 
day that we had, and I said, gosh, I really love that you're so scientific and you don't dabble in this, you know, hypnosis and regression things because I'm a Christian and this seems like a little bit like going to a psychic or a little dark side to me and I'm scared of that. And so what he says to me, this medical doctor says to me, well, actually, some amazing things have come out of past life regressions that are historically factual and really can't be disputed. So what this did is it sparked my interest um, because my son had been telling me at that point for two years that I was his mother when he was Lou Gehrig. I showed him pictures, and he said, Mommy, this was you. You were her. And I never really believed him, right? So I thought, hmm, well, maybe if I do a regression, I can figure out if he's tricking me on this one. So I had I had your own phone number. My girlfriend had given it to me months before. And the minute that Dr. Tucker left, I pulled the piece of paper out. I dialed his number. I called him. I made an appointment for the following week. Um, and that's pretty much where he can take over from here and tell you what happened during our sessions but, you know, without any prompting from him or any anticipation of what would happen, you know, I literally was transported to the life of this woman that my son had been telling me that I was. And, some, you know, I was giving dates and information that there's no possible way I could have known, like things that I only could verify through death certificates. And it took me months to research, actually. So I'll let, I'll let your own take over from here. <laughs> oh, Kathy, it's so good to hear voice. So, yeah, when Cassie came in, I just immediately liked her, and we found out, you know, as we were chatting, you know, the first part of the session, we, we have a conversation, that we were both Geminis, and, you know, it was very much a, um, a Gemini sort of tainted conversation, <laughs> lots of laughter, and um, we just had a lot of fun, is what I remember. And um, yes. so, and yeah, and so we were, we were going through, um, you know, what the structure of the session was like, and she said that she wanted to find out about that past life, so... Um, and she had written, you know, those questions down to be asked to her subconscious. And of course, you know, I, you know, as, as you know, Candace, we don't tell people, you know, you're going to go to this lifetime or go to go to a, a particular place and time. We just let whatever their subconscious um, thinks deems appropriate for the person to see, to experience, to com- to let that come forward. So, you know, I didn't know what we were headed for. So, um um, yeah, so I take her through the induction, and she starts describing this working class environment in the last century on the East Coast. And, um, you know, I just I kept it very um, clean, so to say. I just kind of described what she looks like, what her environment looks like, and, you know, just, you know, stay very factual. And, and you know, as she's describing her body and her environment, it becomes very clear that she is, in fact, um, describing the life of Lou Gehrig's mom, Christina. Um, I think the first session that we did, she she started off sitting on the couch with a little dog. Was it the first session, Kathy? I think so, right? We did it three times. So we actually yeah. have the recordings, and I've written the transcripts. So we did it in April and June and November, I believe. November. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, they do blur together a bit. But I, I, the way <laughs> I remember is the first session was pretty much kind of – the, the Lou Gehrig's life up until her death. Second one was when you were, when she was in Germany and she came over. Right? Yeah, like childhood and then immigrating to the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last one was more detailed, the, the, the details about the um, the objects and the items that you were supposed to verify. Right, to, right. Yeah. So this is really fascinating for me as a, as a practitioner. I had never experienced this before and I haven't experienced it since that the same client will go to the same past life. We, you know, normally I just do one session with somebody and, you know, they might even go to different lifetimes in one session if, you know, um, mm-hmm. but, but Kathy just kept going back to the same, same lifetime, just unearthing more details about it. And, you know, I was fascinated. So I asked her subconscious why, you know, why were we doing this? Why was this lifetime so important for her? And um, it kept saying that she is to write, you know, a story about this and um, get details through the regression that she can verify with still living relatives and friends or people that have known, you know, the Garrick family. So the story would get more credibility for people that need that. Need that. You know, I'm, you know, 
Daffy described, you know, the environment that she's from, you know, she likes science and, you know, things we've been research. I'm completely the opposite, like science, we'll do that later. I just want to first get, <laughs> I want to, I don't want to get to the good woo-woo first, you know, I want to hear about what's possible. And then the science, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out later. <laughs> so, but I, yeah, I really appreciate, I mean, you know, being part of Kathy's process because she is such a great researcher and, you know, I'm very skeptical. I'm I'm from the, I'm from the Netherlands, you know, we're kind of a cerebral, rational people. We don't, you know, go for this woo-woo stuff, but, you know, here I am doing this work and during sessions, sometimes I'm thinking like, you know, are people just pulling my leg? What's going on? So my way of questioning is that I, I ask about really sort of simple, trivial day-to-day things to, to see if people can get those details that, you know, they, they might not know about in their current lifetime so the same was with um with kathy when she described um when i took her to an important day in the lifetime of christina garrick she described walking uh over the parking lot on the parking lot at the yankee stadium and she was wearing you know her beautiful dress because this is the first time that she and her husband would go see their son play at the yankee stadium so i'm thinking well as you're watching a game you, know, you, you, you must be able to People, people snag, you know, they have some food, they have some drinks. I was wondering what people would eat in those days. So I asked her, and she goes, um, you know, I think we're having some warm nuts. And I ask, is it peanuts? And she goes, no, I think it's chestnuts. And I don't think, Kathy, you told me later that you had never even seen chestnuts in your life before. You yeah, I'm from time. California, so I've never even seen a chestnut. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then the other funny thing was, it's like, well, what are you drinking while you're watching a game? And she goes, Oh, we're having a cola, you know. Who says that? <laughs> yeah, which a word that I have never used. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really funny. And then I remember you using some German words as well, like some some German nicknames. Or um, I think your your husband at the time was well, you're you know in your past life. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, Hein Heinrich was that his full name? Heinrich. Yeah. 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 The other and, funny thing about that Yankee game too was remember when you said like. Um, you said, "Oh, your son. He he's he a good player?" And I said, "He's the new kid." You know, like just words that I wouldn't use. I said, "He's the new kid," and then you immediately said, "Well, how old is he?" And I said, "22." Like numbers yeah. would just come out of my mouth, and then I would get home. There's no way that I knew how old Lou Gehrig was when he played his first major league game. You know, like even yeah. I I would never know when he switched from the minor leagues to the major leagues to, and he was literally 22 his first season for the Yankees. So just little and the word cola and my voice my intonation was different. I my um my English like I would say gotta and gonna and like all these in, inflections that I never would use in my real life. Yeah, it was, it was just so fascinating, Kathy. That's just. Uh, yeah. May I ask what was going on in in your um, you know in in your mind thinking about all of this? Were you going back and forth? Were you struggling with the concept? Were you? I mean, what was? I, I can imagine you know different scenarios of what might be happening just internally as you're thinking about all yeah. this. But can you talk talk yeah. about that a little bit? Well, I would say your conscious mind is always kind of in a battle with your subconscious. It seems like like when you're when you're in that state, which I have to say it felt like five minutes and it was like two hours or three hours, some you know crazy amount of time, but you really feel like it's five minutes, but you're very present and you hear these words coming out of your mouth and you almost don't believe it as you're saying it, but you remember everything and and another strange thing from that session where my logical mind could not catch up with it until about six months later because it was so strange, was um, at the very end of the session, you know, he took me to the end of my life and I said I was in a hospital and I could feel, you know, I described my body. He has a great way of having you be in, you know, I was inside of this body. I could see my hands. I could see my feet. I could see everything in the room. You know, I explained how I died and that I was cremated and I described my funeral and, and then I go out of my body and I go, you know, basically into a heavenly state. Um, and I see my family and he says, do you see Lou? And I said, yes. And then he said, what does he say to you? And he comes up and he gives me a hug. I said, he gave me a hug. And he said, I will find you. Okay. So then this was the weird part wow. for me. You were talking like, what is your conscious mind thinking when this is happening? 
So I'm just like saying these things but not really believing it. And all of a sudden, I start crying. And this is me who does not believe in regressions, who doesn't believe in the woo-woo. You know, like, mm-hmm. And I have tears like flowing down my cheeks, you know. And so he says, I see that you're emotional. You know, what are you feeling? And I say, because he did see me and he's Christian, you know, and I'm, I'm crying through it. But I have to say, once I left there, I was like, okay, that's the strangest thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. <laughs> and I'm not even sure if I believe it. <laughs> so I think every time I went back and it would happen again, it gave me more and more proof. And in the very last regression, there was just some amazing things where I brought up information that I was able to verify through people who are still living today that there's no, absolutely no way I could have gotten this information from the Internet, from a book. Like it was private information that only their family would know. So I think that's when I was finally convinced that it was all real. <laughs> you know? I, I was well, just really blown I... away. Oh, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead, your own. What were you going to say? Yeah, you go. I mean, I was just blown away by. I mean, I, I mean, I've heard, I heard the name Lou Gehrig. You know, Lou Gehrig's disease. That's what I was familiar with. I, I didn't even know he was a baseball player. So I found that out during his session. And you know, I thought the session went really well, and I was just really happy with the information that we had gotten and like the, the questions that were um, answered by the subconscious. And then later, Kathy starts emailing me just pictures and all these facts that matched, um, match what she had told me about during the session. So I was. I was blown away because up until that time, I, I had not had a client that um, had a past life persona that you know whose life could be checked and verified. So that was, yeah, you know, that was mind blowing for me. Um, right. Yeah, that's what that was. Yeah. Yeah, it, and I have to say, like one thing, there were little details. Maybe you guys can tell me more about this because you're more familiar. But I got like all the all the numbers seemed to be right, except there was one is that as I was dying, he said, "How old are you?" And I said, "62." Like that number, 62 came out. And when I researched it later, she was 72 when she passed away. So I always wonder with that one thing. I'm like, why did I have that wrong? You know, is the memory hmm. imperfect, or is the information coming through? I mean, it was similar, but it wasn't. Like right on, like everything else was. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Well, there's I, probably I, a lot of different ways to explain that. I, I know, you know, we're sort of taught in general when we do this type of exploration to actually not specifically ask for things like that, addresses, okay. names, names, exactly, because this engages a part of the brain that's very analytical, very logical, and sometimes can tend, not always, but can tend to shut down a session. So oh, we kind of... We kind of shy away from that uh, direct question, and yet, if in a session like that, if the client, you know, offers this information, of course we write it down. I mean, I've written yeah. down addresses before, you know, when characters have gotten into cab cabs and uh, other things like that. But wow. as Jaron was saying, it's um, you know, we take these clients to lives but most of them don't have a history that you can get onto the internet and find out about, you know, if you're just, you know, a butcher or baker or a candlestick maker at or some, candlestick you know, maker, some point, yeah. you know, some, <laughs> some point in, you know, in yeah. history uh, around the planet, you can't really find out about, um, you know, you can't verify the way that, that, that you were able to. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't get stuck on those numbers so much because it's, you know, like what Ken just explained, it can, it can sort of bring in more of the conscious mind. Um, mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I was just fascinated by what, what, what was matching. I mean, it was like what, 95% of the information, yeah. like, the, 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 you know, the birth and the death of his, um, look at uh, siblings, um, you know, all the dates uh, when they went, like the sequence of when they died. And I mean, it's stuff that, yeah, I, I went through, like, stuff. the death of these children. I know that was really, like, heart-wrenching, too. To even listen to that recording is almost upsetting when I talk about, like, my baby dying and when mm-hmm. and where and what time of year and how. And that was one where I ordered the death certificate and it was all correct. Yeah. I'm, Good. Isn't that amazing? Like, isn't that amazing that she, I mean, the research that she's doing, you know, she's done to verify 
you know, this, this past life experience. I've, you know, I've not had anybody who took it this serious and really, um, you know, put, put the, um, the facts together with what she uncovered in the session. I was, I was just really amazed by it. I have I have one year on that I haven't even told you about that just happened recently that I that I really discovered. Um I just came back from Bali for the month of November where I actually wrote an entire book on the journey from the beginning up until now. Um and Yaron is a big part of that. And um and on my way on the plane on the way to Bali I watched this movie called The Pride of the Yankees, which is a movie about Lou Gehrig's life. Um and it's Star Gary Cooper is the star of the movie, and in that movie they have a scene. They 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 have Lou Gehrig retires from baseball and he gives his speech at Yankee Stadium where he says, "Today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth, and I may have been given a bad break, but I have an awful lot to live for." Well, as he's giving this speech in this Hollywood rendition of his life, he knows that he's going to be dying soon. He's been told that he has you know less than a year or two to live. Well, one thing that came up when we did our regression was that I talk about my son retiring from baseball, and I'm on the field. I'm in. This was my first regression that we did together. I'm I'm on. I'm there watching him retire. I talk about how the the cameras are hurting my ears. Like it's very sensory. The sounds, the the smells, the the everything is just so vivid. Um, and so then when he says go to the next significant scene in the life of this woman, then I go forward and my son has passed away. And I talk about being very surprised by his death, like we had no idea it was coming. You know, I say very specific things that we had no no idea that he was going to die. Well, that summer I was able to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame Museum in Cooperstown. And because my son was there with two Hall of Fame baseball players, one is Tommy Lasorda, and the other one is Orlando Cepeda, who's the coach, who one of the, his son is the coach of my son's travel baseball team. I was given access to all of the private documents of the Garrick family. Like I was able to spend oh like six goodness. hours. It, it's really crazy. I was able to spend six hours a day in the Giamatti Research Center, and the librarians would bring down shelf, you know, bring down a tray to me every day of these documents that were 100 years old that can only be touched with white gloves and they're only really supposed to be accessed by the family of the person. Well, I was able to go through it and I found a letter from Lou Gehrig's mother-in-law to his mother and it says, I swear to you on my life that Lou did not know he was going to die until the day he breathed his last breath or something like this. And that, that's, we had never told you and we never told Lou that he was going to die. My daughter never told anybody. So what's wow. truly amazing is that this information that came out of the regression actually kind of changes history because as far as everybody else knows, when Lou Gehrig gave that speech, he knew that he was going to die. But according to the regressions and according to this letter from his mother-in-law, who's his wife's mother, he had no idea he was going to die up until the moment that he passed away. Wow. Oh my wow. goodness. That's amazing. Kathy, no wonder you're writing a book. No wonder. Yeah, and I I do I feel like this stuff that's come through like it's not an accident and it just needs to be shared and Luke Eric's story, it's like a you know, a story that's kind of drifting away and people don't really even know who he is. Young kids, you know. Mhm. So because it came through I feel like I, a responsibility to share it, you know. Can I ask a question, Kathy? Um, kind of a um, a question about your again a, a, your internal life, like like your dreams or your daydreams or things that small things that might happen to you just in your own daily life. My, I guess my question is: Did any of those things change for you? Did you? Uh, find yourself feeling um, connected to Christina or, you know, did did the other things begin to seem familiar or did you feel an affinity towards some things that, that you didn't or, or did she always seem like this completely separate persona that you, you know, that, that there was a great big line between you? I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what it feels like now. It, it, now my son's memories have pretty much dissipated too, and he's seven now. So what it feels like, like we have a picture of Lou Gehrig and his mother sitting next to my son's bed, and it really almost feels like a relative who's passed away. 
where you look at a picture of your grandmother and you feel forever connected to that person. Does hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you have really like a does. love and an affinity for that person, and that's how my son feels towards Blue Gehrig. I mean, he's he's in his heart, basically. Like, if you ask my son, is is Lou Gehrig alive today? He would say yes. And then, and then he, if you say, well, where is he? He would say, in my heart. That's that's kind of the best way to describe it. Oh, so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and how about you then? Do you feel that too with Christina? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do. Mm-hmm. I definitely do. And and how about this? Uh, I wonder this. Have things changed for you at all? Again, like, you know, were you an active daydreamer? Did you really remember your dreams? Did um, did you have kind of a any kind of fantastical life in your own mind? And did that change after all of this? Did it get? Did did it grow? I would say, especially my dreams at night, like what I've really come to the conclusion through this whole thing is that tapping into this subconscious mind is really a gateway to the divine. I really feel that, and I feel that since I had these sessions with your own, like, what was it, a year and a half ago or so, um, it's really activated my subconscious mind in a way that even when I'm sleeping at night, I get very vivid dreams sometimes with messages and it's just a part of my brain that wasn't really open before maybe like a third eye that kind of blasts open you know mhm very interesting so do you have a do you have a title for your book yet i know you're working on it and you are in the completion I do. stages <laughs> i do i do i do it's called the boy who knew too much the boy who knew too much um and that we can share with you kind of the big concluding thing. Do you want to share that part, your own, about the jewelry? Um, yeah, of- I was just wondering about it because, yeah, I remember, thank you, um, during a session there was um, like a little necklace, I think it was, with a was it like jade or something that was in it? A jade necklace and a charm bracelet from Japan. Right. And there was something with a bird, right? Yeah, well, I was living with a family. Yeah, it was like, I know this stuff so well because I just got done writing the book, so I know it in and out. (laughs) So in the very last session, I spent the whole time talking about a family that I lived with in the last couple years of my life. I described the floor plan of their house, what their house looked like from the outside, what my car looked like. I said I would go to the Little League games. I described two children, or I described children that I lived in the house with and this family, um, and I said, there's a seven-year-old little girl with short brown hair and a 10-year-old little boy who plays Little League, and I go to all of his games, and I bring cookies, and all the kids come running to my car. You know, this, these things all came out through questions that your own would ask me, but that's basically what came out. Um, and then I said that I had, you know, he asked, oh, do you have any things that you own? And I said, yeah, I have this trunk with my things in it. And I described some jewelry, and I said, I'd like the little girl to have it, but I probably need to give it to her mother to hold on to until she gets older. Well, he had me describe what the jewelry looked like. Um, And then after our session, I was able to go through the research I had done in the summer. I found the name of a family that was getting, the the Hall of Fame Museum was going to be making copies of pictures for them in 1954 when Christina Garrett passed away. I was able to find these people, and not only did I have the ages right of these children when you calculate it, I found them. So the woman who was seven is now a 70-year-old realtor in Connecticut, and the man who was 10 years old in my regression is a 73-year-old pastor. And this pastor um, was kind of a renowned, amazing man. Um, He would be a really interesting person to talk to, too. He worked with Martin Luther King, Jr., He um, worked in Salem, Massachusetts for 16 years as the head pastor of a church where they helped the witches get out of witchcraft, like a a really amazing man. He runs tours to Israel. Um, So I called him with my past life story thinking I was going to (laughs) get kicked to the curb, but he was really the only person that I could run this jewelry thing by. And I explained to him everything from beginning to end, and I said, so what do you think? And he said, I think it's fascinating. And he said, I can't go along with the 
reincarnation theory because it's not part of my faith because he's a Methodist pastor. He said, but I can tell you that you described the floor plan of my house perfectly, and I can tell you that my sister did inherit the jewelry you're describing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, my goodness. You described. And oh, here's the amazing thing, the most amazing thing, this jewelry has been buried under their house for 60 years because when they inherited it, it was far too valuable for them to insure. So they kept it. They built a walk-in safe under their house. And their mother just passed away last summer. Um, and so they've never really told anyone that they have this jewelry. So That's that crazy. was when I was convinced. I was like, okay, this is the information I needed so that I could believe this stuff. <laughs> Fascinating. Wow. You know, I, didn't, I, I don't think I knew this. This is like new information for me. I'm, I'm you know, because I was wondering about it. I was also wondering about the, um, I remember as Christina, you opened a trunk and then there was a, um, it was almost like a metal, like it had like Japanese a metal. inscription. Yep, like yeah. a metal from Japan. There were some, yeah, all of these things that I could see so clearly, you know. Did you remember? And they did remember? keep the dog and the bird. They did keep the dog and the bird. Remember you said, well, what are you going to do with your pets when you die? And I said, I think the family's going to keep them for me. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, I, I care so, for animals so much. So. <laughs> yeah, and I What's talked going about how we cover, cover the birds. Right. Yeah, you were worried about the dog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so this pastor is just such a lovely man, and he's got stories galore about this woman, Mom Gehrig, and how she started the Little League there in Milford, Connecticut. Yeah. So I can't wait for May the book I- to come out. May I ask some questions about um, the whole concept of of Lou Gehrig and his his illness? Did that come up in the session at all? I'm trying to think. What do you, I know what I I know what I kept saying because he said, "Well, do you know what it is?" And I said something with his nervous system, but we don't really know. And I kept saying, "But he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay." Yeah. Exactly. That was, it was like mm-hmm. it was just a, maybe a few words that were mentioned about it, you know, and then that's what I remember. And then when we moved, you know, we moved you further along, he had already passed. Um, but yeah, it he seemed like passed. something that, yeah, but it seemed like something that was not, you know, it was very aware, was very present in her life. Like she didn't know, like oh, he's gonna be fine. Yeah, yeah. The, the funnier thing that kept coming up was the rivalry between the mother and the daughter-in-law. I kept saying, she's a funny lady, and then Jerome would ask me, well, where is she now? And I'd say, oh, probably Hollywood. She's a Hollywood type. <laughs> like, right. I kept making fun of her, kind of. And then the letter that I found talks about raging fights between the mother and the daughter-in-law. I think it's funny, too, because I heard you say, well, she's a funny lady, and I had a feeling that you as Christina was sort of, you know, you would hold back and you wouldn't sort of openly talk bad about others. So when you said, you know, she's a funny lady, I think I asked you, like, well, funny how, you know. Yeah, funny how, exactly. Because I've never really said anything (laughs) mean about her. So you can tell that Christina's kind of a nice person. Right. (laughs) Yeah, she was very, very nice. So not funny, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I guess some of the questions that I I, I meant about the the illness was in when you were in the you know the SC part, the subconscious or the higher self portion of the session was was that talked about at all the the sort of maybe the the life plan or the contract between the two of them. Um, concerning, you know, the illness and, and the son dying before the mother. Yeah, well, you know what was interesting about it? I think you're on the most, like, amazing thing that came out was he asked me, like, what's the purpose of you and of Kathy and Christian reuniting in this lifetime? And mm-hmm. my higher self, what I said, which is kind of simple and profound at the same time, I said to relive the good times. So it really wasn't even about, like, mm-hmm. evolution of the soul. It was really to go, like, eat an ice cream cone, go to a baseball game. like, And it's given me, like, this greater appreciation for just the day-to-day, you know, wonderful things that life has to offer, you know? Mm-hmm. Because we're here to have fun and experience joy and 
And often we have yeah. to be reminded of that. Kathy, yeah, that's how, something I never think of yet. <laughs> how how do some of the people around you who may be um, aware of, of course, now your story and some of your research and all of that, have you found different reactions to you uh, personally um, since the stories come out and you're interested in it and you're writing the book? And what would some of those reactions be if you care to share share them at all? Yeah, well, here's the funny thing. You guys are the first ones to really even hear about it. <laughs> like even the people closest to me don't know this much. Um just because of that, it's a little scary. I did have some, you know, I write about it in the book, how when I first told my two closest friends, you know, they kind of made fun of me and they said, ah, oh, he probably, you know, saw it on TV or, you know, they just tried to discount it and it really hurt me, you know, and we've mm-hmm. had neighbors, you know, kind of make fun of Christian, my son, about it. And we had a baseball coach, like an opposing baseball coach, say, oh, that's the kid who thinks he's Lou Gehrig. You know, kind of hurtful stuff. So I am prepared for that because I know, you know, especially there's, you know, people who are conservative and and I come from that background myself, so I get it, is that this is kind of an unconventional, you know, not fully accepted concept. Um, And kind of at the end, the conclusion I come to is because I don't want to influence people to believe one thing or the other, if I say, you know, I can't say with certainty that reincarnation is a fact, you know, as much as somebody can say that it's not a fact, no one really knows the mm-hmm. mystery of life, right? But really mm-hmm. my main conclusion at the end of the story is I say the one thing I know for sure now is that love never dies and that the soul mm-hmm. is eternal, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful so. realization. You know, I think it's also really interesting that a story like this um, – comes through you, Cassie, you know, being from the background that you're from, you know, you like you are sort of, you know, from a more conservative place and religious. And because I'm thinking if you write your story and you've got it backed up with so many of these, you know, facts that you verified and checked, I think um, the people that, you know, from your sort of, would you call it like a, a demographic, you know, they might be more open right. to listening to somebody like you, um, you know, right. closer to them and who has, you know, check the fact, and it might open them up to, you know, you know, having a more open mind about about this. And even just matter. the possibility, right? And the one thing I have to say, even as a Christian, I never knew the history of the Christian church. I never knew that the early scriptures actually talked about rebirth and reincarnation, yep. you know, like, so I was yep. able to research that. So that's, yeah, exactly. You've studied that. See, I, it's not something that the average Christian is exposed to the history of the church, you know? Mm-hmm. So I get to put, you know, that's in my, in my journey, a part of my journey. And really I go through the Eastern religions. I go through the Jewish religions. I go through all of it. And it, you know, I come to the conclusion at the end that it's okay to be a Christian and have Christian faith and believe in reincarnation. They're not mutually exclusive, you know? Exactly. At least that's most of what our community has also come to the conclusion of. But, of course, you get to decide as a human being what your belief system is. So whatever. Right. And it's not a hard job, my, right? My husband would say. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, like that's a big job. I don't want that responsibility to tell other people what to think. <laughs> so Christian's still a baseball player. Yeah, he is. He is. He's, he he still has the love of the game and um, and is still interested in continuing to play ball. That's wonderful. Yeah, he plays a lot. He plays five games almost every weekend all year round. <laughs> Well, I, I, it, it would seem to me that the book that you're writing, I mean, you know, maybe this is something I don't have any right to say, but it seems like it would only be like the first book. You know what I mean? That, oh, so you know, you, your, your son is, is young and still very interested in ball playing, and um, it's Maybe it's my intuition or maybe it's just because I love stories so much. It would seem to me like there, there's going to be another story at some some point in time. That would be interesting and, to uh, see the end of the story, right? Whether it's that he doesn't play baseball or continues to play, like it's still kind of interesting to see how it plays out, right? 
Mm-hmm. He, the other interesting mm-hmm. thing, he's left-handed too, and Lou Gehrig was left-handed, and you know his his technique was very similar to Lou Gehrig's. It's changed a bit now, but if you look at the early videos of him when he was two and three and four, his technique was exactly like Lou Gehrig. That that's really interesting. Now, how about physical characteristics? Is he going to be a tall boy? Do they have the same nose? You know, the same hair yeah, color? Well, they, how about okay, that? Here's you know, I haven't written about this in the book, but they both have these deep, deep, deep dimples. Like if you see my son, that's all you see is his dimples. And if you look at a picture of Lou Gehrig, <laughs> all you see is his dimples. And it's not mm. something that's really genetically present in our family. Like it's not like I have dimples. So, and then another funny thing is that if you look at the ancestral ties, my husband is an immigrant from Germany. He came here when he was 18. His family is from the exact same region in Germany that Lou Gehrig's family immigrated from, from this area that was called Schleswig Holstein, which own can tell you about because it's near where he's from. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, there's also, like, that whole part that's a little bit, you know, interesting and kind of strange at the same time, too. Mm-hmm. And and what was Lou Gehrig's wife's name again, then, the, the daughter-in-law's Eleanor. name? Eleanor. 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 And she passed away. I want to say she passed away in like the eighties. Mhm. Do you? I mean, does your mind wander like mine would? Like, you know, is is she reincarnating? Is she a little girl in your son's school right now? I mean, do you think about things like well, that? I kind of joke about it because here I'm trying to write this book to set the record straight because Eleanor Gehrig was the one who did the movie Pride of the Yankees and she painted Lou Gehrig's mother horribly in that movie. And in mm-hmm. her own book, which is called My Luke and I, she writes about Lou Gehrig's mother and she say, she writes, Mom Gehrig was no hero, and then she proceeds yeah. to, you know, kind of badmouth her. So I always joke that I'm going to do my book, and then Eleanor is going to come back and get me back. <laughs> <That's> so funny! <laughs> but you can never get the last word, right? <laughs> that is so funny. Fight across lifetimes. Oh my God. Yep. You never know, right? <laughs> very, very interesting. Well, I'm happy to hear any other thing about the book or um, any other topic that this has brought forth into your life or your family's life um, or even, you know, yours, um, your own, how how this has changed you or your practice, um, you know, what – what some of what are some of the big conclusions that you've come to? I know that you said, uh, Kathy, you know, to find joy in your life, but um, um, I just want to, you know, make sure that we're we're getting all of the all of the things that you want to say about this tonight. Um, Do you want you want to take I, that one? Yeah. Should I go first? Sure. Um, yeah. So for me, I mean, like I said, you know, being from from Northern Europe, and um, you know, we're not very religious group of people like I was I was raised in Catholic Church for a little bit but I didn't have any experience of spirit at all there was no joy there was no beauty it was just very very boring and um, repetitive and uh, it just didn't leave any mark so my parents were raised in post-war Netherlands which was very you know religion was more about discipline and doing what you're supposed to be doing so they you know they had a really bad taste in their mouth from you know being brought up as Catholic. So when I was about seven years old, they stopped taking me to church. And when I talked to them not too long ago, and I asked them, so, you know, asked them, what, what do you believe about life? Like, what do you believe about it? And they say, well, we just believe that, you know, you live your life and um, you're supposed to be kind to people because that's how you, that's how you live on in the hearts of others, you know, and, and the good deeds that you do and how you treat, treat other people, which is, I think, really beautiful. But in terms of like, you know, like a, past life or, uh, you know, life after lifetimes or there's none of that. Like they've completely, um, uh, you know, they don't, they don't believe in anything really. So, um, me, you know, I've, I've, I believe more than, than, than they do now because, um, because of the experiences I've had through my clients and, and Cassie's experience is sort of pivotal on that because before, you know, I, I listened to these people telling me all these wonderful, wonderful stories that, you know, I want to believe so badly. And then Kathy comes in and she 
you know, she does the same thing and she fact checks and, um, you know, and everything matches. That was really, um, it was very it was sort of consolidating for me. And um, I, I, I consider myself lucky that I had another client who um, also had a, a past life that was verifiable. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. You know, Kathy, before you before you do any wrapping up, up yourself, we actually now, um, there's a couple of, of people holding who have questions. So okay. how about we take a couple questions, okay? That sounds good. Sure. Hey, I have a little visitor in my office if you want to say hi to <gasps> Christian real quick. <laughs> you want to say, of course. Christian, just say hello. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> He said, not unless I take him to my Christmas party. <laughs> He's not wanting to stay with a babysitter. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, I'm happy to do that. One thing, I just want to compliment your own real quickly, too, is that I think what made our session so successful, because I'm guessing you have people that listen that are practitioners as well, but I think I just felt so safe in his company, and I trusted him so much, mm-hmm. and I think that's what let me really go to that place. Oh, mm-hmm. thank you. That's a great, that's a great compliment. Well, let's um, let's go ahead and take a question and see what some um, some of our audience have to say or have questions about. And um, you are now live, area code seven zero four. You have your hand up for a question. Hello, hello everyone. How are you? Hi. Hi. Who do we have? Who do we have Um, tonight? Who are you? My name is Kim. I'm calling from Florida. Hi, Kim. Kim. Thank you Hi, for Kim. calling. Um, I have a question for Ka- uh, for Kathy. Um, um, since your son is still pretty young, should should he have his own QHHT session when he gets a little older just to make sure that he doesn't develop the ALS again in this life? You know what? That's a really good question. And I had an interesting thing happen where I um, was able to meet Wayne Dyer right before he passed away last June. And he was writing this book called Memories of Heaven, which is all about children's past life memories and invisible friends and memories of heaven. Well, um, Wayne had done a regression with this woman, Mira Kelly, who Yaron and I both know well. And she actually came to our house and did a session with my son and primarily to address his breathing issues because he's had asthma since he was a baby. And it was really interesting. I was very reluctant to do it because he's so young. Um, but, it, you know, she brought him to a place where he could give his breathing issues back to Lou Gehrig. And I have to say, I've been reluctant to put it in the book because it's so recent. It was only almost a year ago. But he has not had any breathing problems since then. So, you know, it probably wouldn't help to do a little more of that in the future, I think. I think it would be it would be interesting if he had a session when he gets a little older. And that way he can write his own book. Yeah, that's be a, a good sequel point. to your book. I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Kim. Do you have do you and have I, another question? And by the way, by the way, really quickly, uh, I do wanted to say I did want to say that um, I, I saw a movie years ago when I was probably twenty, and I'm now fifty four. And um, and that movie about Lou Gehrig, I don't know, it really impacted me, and it made me want to become a student of psychology and everything, and now my uncle has been diagnosed with ALS. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, my goodness. So your life has been touched by that. Oh, my goodness. Oh. So, but um, I do hope to get a chance to read your book when it comes out, so. Oh, thank you so much, Kim. Thanks for calling, Kim. Yeah, well, stay tuned for um, for that. Do you... Um, do you have a publisher lined up and a date and all that kind of stuff, um, Kathy, or you know, is that you know all what? going to work? Well, I sent my um, – Hay House was waiting for my proposal since June when I met Wayne Dyer, and I just finished it in November, right before I left for Bali, and I sent it to them. So I, there's nothing official, but it's you know it's all kind of in the works, and then we have a friend sure. at Sony, Sony Pictures who's kind of interested in – possibly doing a movie on it, too. So it, we'll see how that all unfolds next year. Sure. <laughs> and and Jerome, you guy? probably... 
You could play yourself in the movie, wouldn't you? I, I was about to say, the guy, the guy playing me better be cute. <laughs> <laughs> very handsome, because you're on a very well, handsome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take another question from the audience, shall we? So um, I am turning the mic over to area code 780. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. And Hello. what's your name? I'm Naomi. Hi, Hi Naomi. Naomi. Thanks for calling. What's your question? Um, I was just wondering, like, how could you, um, like, how would I be able to remember any of my past lives on my own? On your own? own? You want to take that one? Sure. I mean, on your own, I I would think it would be helpful to find a practitioner that can help you do that because it's, you know, it's so much more um, conducive to your to your uh, state of mind and being able to get to the details of your past life when you have somebody with you that sort of, um, you know, holds space for you and knows how to guide you and um, sort of direct your, your focus so you can unearth the details of, you know, your past life or past lives. Okay. It's yeah, and you can like do that remotely too. Like you could do it remotely. Like you can even do it on the phone. Like you don't really have to be with the person, but I think it works much better when you do have a practitioner asking you the questions rather than just a generic pre-recorded thing. Because you can't yeah. do generic pre-recorded sessions, but I think the one-on-one is much more valuable. Yeah, I mean, okay, cool. you know, it's it's helpful to be with somebody because there there's stuff that can happen during a session. Like there's you know, stuff that the body can show, um, uh, you know, and um, that the practitioner is aware of um, and that can be used during a session, um, you know, like movements or um, breathing that happens or uh, certain, you know, that the eyes that start tearing or different things that can happen during a session that you cannot uh, monitor over the phone. So, um, oh, like, like, like as, as Candace knows that, you know, we've been taught by Dolores and, um uh, so that's what we don't do any um, oh, long distance that's sessions. Good to know. Okay, yeah. good. Good because, to know. Because because it's, it's difficult to monitor the body, you know. And also, like me and Candice, we had some technical difficulties before we started this um, this talk here on, oh, yeah. on the radio. And what if like the Skype connection like falls away, and you know, and you're trying to like get yeah. somebody for you back and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, good point. Oh. That's a really good yeah. point. Well, you know, these sessions can be very emotional. And, uh, it, mm-hmm. you know, Kathy, you yourself said how important it was, the trust that you felt with your mm-hmm. own as your, your practitioner. And you're probably going to feel safer and uh, trust your practitioner a little better if they're right there in the room with you. And right. although it's rare, sometimes, you know, very strange things can happen when you are going into that realm. I'm thinking right now of a particular session I had with a woman who she was having a past life memory of being this, um, this uh, woman. She was a, a slave on a plantation and she was actually a very happy woman. She was older. She felt uh, cared for, both by, you know, the the plantation owner and and she had a big family and she'd gotten to be this age in, where she wasn't working anymore and the, she was just sitting on the porch. It was actually a very happy life, believe it or not. And she had wow. suffered a stroke when we I moved her forward to a, a particular day and she, you know, had suffered a stroke and she was still sitting in her rocking chair on the porch. But she was talking about how one part of her body wasn't working anymore and Actually, wow. in the regression, during the time that I'm looking at her, she starts drooling out of the side of, wow. of the mouth uh, of her face that wasn't working anymore. One whole side of her wow. face wasn't moving anymore. Wow. And so, the, you wow. know, these things are these kinds of explorations. You know, you really are time traveling. I mean, you're time traveling. Yeah, Let's and you, you do. I can see how you do need like a guide there with you. Exactly, mm-hmm. like to be at your side. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And 
Naomi, I, I will say this, and um, uh, some people were talking about this over over in the chat room. Wonderful, wonderful Lorraine um, Chisholm, who is also a, a QHHT practitioner, mentioned this in the chat room. You can sometimes, just on your own, you can try this. You can try telling yourself um, before going to bed. You can kind of program a dream. You know, you can program yourself to have a dream about a past life, you know, try to make it, you know, um, something that, that you might enjoy experiencing. You might ask your higher self to give you a dream of a past life when you were very happy, you know, et cetera. Um, and see where idea. that takes you. Yeah. That's a yeah, good that's idea. Yeah. That sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for the call, Naomi. Thanks, Naomi. Well, thank Bye, you. Naomi. Bye. Have a good night. You, you too. too. Thank you. Well, that was really great to have a couple of questions there for you all. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any more? Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any more questions at at the moment. Um, and I, I guess I'd just like to have Kathy go ahead and uh, wrap up anything else you'd, you'd like to say, and, and we'll let you go back to, to Christian and your pre-Christmas um, celebration. <laughs> yeah, well, he just he just fell asleep on my lap, so I don't have to worry about him. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Put him to sleep. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank you guys because this was like a really, you know, big deal for me to actually talk about this stuff, you know, openly, and and you've created a very safe place for me to do that, so thank you for that. Oh. Gosh, you're so thank welcome. You for, and I'm, yeah. Thank you for your willingness to, um, you know, to come on the radio show and, and share your experiences. Yeah. It was so helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, we'd like to know, and your own, please let us know as soon as the book is is published and how we can get a hold of it. And you know, we'll we'll combine all of these things together. Maybe, you know, uh, we'll have a, a YouTube replay of the show, but we can combine it with a blog article that's already gone out and we'll, you know, send out another article when, when the book is published. Will you let us know, Kathy, in your Beautiful, own? beautiful. Thank you. The boy who Definitely. knew too much. Definitely. And Candace and Jerome, I'm, I can send you what I have now, too, if you want to take a little sneak peek. Ah, oh, I would do. love that. I would okay, love that. Cool. I come from I come from a family that loves baseball, so it would be oh, really? a lot of fun to oh, do wow. that. Uh-huh. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Okay. It's a first draft, so any okay. suggestions are appreciated. <laughs> oh. Oh, would be honored. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye, Kathy. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks you guys. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Kathy. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Okay. Well, your own. I, you know, this has been such a treat. Just such a treat. I remember when when you first told us about your session on our support forum with the other practitioners, and it was. It, it's been a lot of fun seeing this come together. First, the article, and then you know the opportunity to to actually speak with your client like this, and even Christian, who came in and we heard his little voice there a little bit, and got to and you got to hear even more details about some of the the proof that she has found and the connection and the stories with other people. What a fascinating case! I know it's really amazing. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just my it, it really blew my mind too. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's very fascinating. Well, in the little time that we have left, we've got about 10 minutes or so left uh, in the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your practice there in in the Los Angeles area? Oh, and by the way, I just happened to get an email from somebody like yesterday or the day before who was asking me about anyone who practiced in exactly that area. And, of course, we've got several wonderful practitioners and I and I told her to be sure she listened to the show tonight. Oh. You actually do you actually do uh quite a few workshops where you do group regressions, is that true? Yes, thank you for asking me about it. I do um you know, as you know, Dolores um recorded some group um group uh past life exploration. So 
I do those once a month, every first Friday of the month. I think in January, though, I'm doing it the second uh, second Friday because it's just after New, New Year's, the first one. Um, and I really love doing um, the group processes because, you know, there's so many different people present and afterwards people share about their experiences. And so both me and all the participants, we get such a broad view of what is possible in this technique. Like, you know, people go to past lives. As I remember being... Uh, one guy being a dinosaur, you know, people living in shacks and you know, sending to, uh, you know, cattle or being an alien and, you know, walking into their current into their current body. I mean, you know, such a broad variety of experiences that are being, um, that are being told uh, about. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I find those groups really, it's like a little sample session. And um, the beauty, the beautiful thing of, of those groups is as well that, it seems to provide a bit of community for people that, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of mythology out there for people that have had sort of odd experiences, like metaphysical experiences. They might, you know, experience, you know, being visited by beings or having a very strong connection to their guides and communicate with them. Um, or people with a very strong mm-hmm. sense of mission. I find that the younger generation, you know, the, the, the third wave as we call them, you know, have such a st- strong sense of purpose here. And um, when they come to the groups, then it's like people find community and they find recognition and in the way they feel. And that's always a really beautiful thing for me to see. But yeah, so I do those groups uh, once a month, first Friday of the month. Um, and I do meditations every Thursday evening and Sunday morning in the Los Angeles area. So you can find the information on my website. And, uh, yeah, I love doing this work. I love people. You know, I love to see people open up their minds and, and waking up and um, finding out about the beauty, the beauty that, you know, that we all are um, at our core. All mm-hmm. part of the, all the all that is. So let me ask you this. I, I do my fair share of group regressions. I, I get really busy, and, and sometimes it's a while between them. I don't do them as regularly as you do any anymore. But do you have, like, groupies, like people who show up to do them all the time because they just think they're so fun? Or do you do you have regular influx of new people? Um, both, actually. Yeah, um, there's a a couple of them, they they keep coming back, and then there's others that just um, yeah, just new people that come in. Yeah, so people mm-hmm. do it for, for various reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's and, and that's may I you? ask to, uh, you know, I think I get a lot of repeats, but you know, I'm in a much different place than than where you are. You know, there's many. Right. Uh, many more people where you live and a little bit of a different mindset, I think, um, than, right. than where I am here <laughs> in, <Right. laughs> in, in Kansas. Although, although right. you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember uh, when we first moved here, the little tiny town where I have my wellness studio right now uh-huh. uh, my husband Tom and I were just walking down down the street and there's this tiny tiny little um, kind of a you know you call it a, a drive drive in place but it's just a like almost like a little room where people stop to get hot dogs or burgers or just a little lunch place just right on the main road there. And right. I mean, you don't even go in to eat. There's like a couple picnic tables outside of this, uh, this place. And it's been there for a very, very long time. And it's very, um, it's very um, campy, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful, very interesting little building. And, um, while we were having our French fries fried or whatever it was we were eating, I remember looking at the um, papers and, you know, um, little posters that people had tacked to the side of this, uh, of this little um, lunch shack, shall we say. Uh And I looked at it and there was a paper uh, describing a get together for UFO watchers. Um, oh, no way. And I remember, I know, and I remember looking that at that, and I was thinking, you know, I'm going to fit in just fine here, just just fine. <laughs> if if this 
if this little, you know, lunch shack on Main Street can openly um, talk about a meeting, uh, you know, where some UFO enthusiasts are getting together, um, we're going to do just fine right here. And that's really what it's ended up being. I've, I've mostly, you know, a lot of people have no idea and a lot of people have a lot of questions, but I've really have not found any, any, um, any negativity at all. Most people are, are quite interested. That's so good to hear. I was I was wondering about that because, you know, I'm wondering like where where your where your practice is like the because you're in a commercial area, right? Well, yes, but it's a very very small town. I mean, um, it's right. it's a little um, suburb, a little bedroom community of the larger town, which is Wichita. The the metro right. area itself has about half a million people, but I don't I don't know how many uh, people actually live in the little town of Augusta that's just east wow. of it. But it's uh, it's it's you know it's a small town for sure. I mean, <laughs> a very small town. <laughs> that is so amazing. It must have been. I mean, it must have been a sign for you, you know, to see that UFO flyer. Um, you know, because I would be worried about that. Like, oh my God, where you know, why did I just land? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my my first little time there, I didn't, you know, I didn't put up a sign or anything. But you know what? I actually have a tiny little poster in in my window right now, which and it's right across the street from the post office. You know, the you know most everybody in town goes to the post office. Post office. And I have a right. tiny little. I have a tiny little poster in my window, and it it just says it has a little picture, kind of an old fashioned picture of black and white of some kids in a in a wagon, and it says, "Who were you in a past life?" And nice. uh, that's all, you know, just just kind of, you know, just a little bit. <laughs> and, and so, do, the, do your neighbors know what goes on? You know. Um, you know they do. But the the person who has the the shop right next door to me is a hairdresser, and um, she's as kind as can be. And sometimes, you know, they you know how hairdressers are. They can they can really have a good time when they're doing hair. And sometimes right. when when she and her girlfriends sometimes get kind of you know really laughing, I I pick up my phone and, and text. You know, I'm getting ready to start my session. You know. <laughs> Get right. your giggles out now, you know. I mean, you know, we're, we're very good, good friends, good buddies. But uh, she's uh, very, uh, she's very interested, and and will ask very often, you know, how, because when the session is over, then I usually tell her, okay, I'm done with with the session, so you know, you can get back to to laughing loudly. <laughs> Not that it really matters; it's never really mattered at all. But it's just, right. you know, more comfortable that way for me. And so, yeah, you know, the, there's a lot of people who who know what what I do. And, and they ask a lot of questions. Um, mm-hmm. And not, you know, you know, a lot of, a fair number of people, you know, travel in who just find me in other ways. You know, for instance, this right. radio show. But uh, more and more people from the local area absolutely are, are – uh, are interested in coming, coming forward. And something you had said earlier, your own about, you know, people needing to have a place to talk about this kind of stuff. And um, there's yeah. a good number of those people who show up who uh, right. interestingly enough will say some things like, you know, I can't talk to my coworkers about this, but right. they'd be surprised how many of their coworkers are coming and sitting in the, in the same chair saying the exact right. same thing that they can't talk right. to their coworkers about it. It's like, well, <laughs> you, you got to start talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I've, 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 you know, I've had my fair share of people, of those people as well, but um, I mean, you know, of course, like you said, this is Los Angeles where I'm at. So there is just, I'm imagining much more available, you know, different groups. Um, you know, there's a couple of practitioners here, um, there's all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, Los Angeles is a really, really great city for that. It's it's part of the reason why, mm-hmm. you know, I moved here. I um, mm-hmm. when I, I came to the states, I really, yeah, this is like the first place that I've uh, ever felt home. It's 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 a wonderful place to be for the reason, you know, that I I can do what I what I'm supposed to be doing here, and all the wonderful people that are here. There's such a diversity of people mm-hmm. here, and um, you know, sure. it, it shows in the sessions as well. It's yeah, I just I really love 
you know, especially the, the first part of the session when we get to know somebody, it's just, you know, it's just really wonderful to find out about people's lives and, you know, the struggles that they've had. And, um, you know, it's, it's such a, you know, it's such a, a common denominator that all of us, you know, have our own, our own journey, our own path, our own learning, and it's all valuable. And, um, you know, we're, we're all the same in that. And it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. And, um, it helps me to be more compassionate towards myself as well. And, and towards others to find about, mm. find out about other people's lives. Cause you know, you might meet somebody in the grocery store and, you know, they might, I don't know, cut in line or something, but you know, you never know what goes on in their lives. There's, you know, all mm-hmm. of us have our struggles and our mm-hmm. challenges. Yeah. Hey, you know, that, that brings me to something. Uh, I'm thinking about you being there. You know, there's a lot of creative people in Los Angeles and Hollywood and all of that. Uh, do you see a, a fair number of people who are in the movie industry or who are actors? And I wonder, too, about those people and – uh, when they take on roles and characters, you know how how that might be, um, you know, impacted in a in a regression. And if 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 you have any thoughts about that? Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't see any difference differences between, you know, actors and sort of normal people. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, no, I, I didn't see any, any differences. It's more, you know, along the lines of, you know, sort of more, you know, people are more, um, uh, they have a lot of the conscious mind that needs to kept, be kept out of the way or, or not, or they mm-hmm. just go right into it. You know, it's more along those mm-hmm. lines. Uh, but in terms mm-hmm. of, like, actors, um, do you mean, like, it, it becomes easier for them to take on their past life personas? Oh, well, I wondered that, you know? I wondered if, you know, they if they would could step into another life experience like they might step into a role in a in a play or in a film or something. I I know that, you know, you, you talk about this idea of, you know, method actors or whatever, and I wondered if right. some of those people, you know, might be, I mean, I, I really don't know. I don't have a lot of uh, theater people in, in my own circle of friends, and um, so I just kind of wondered about that. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, I yeah, I haven't seen, you know, it, usually it's, it's surprising to me people that do go, you know, completely into the past lives. It might be somebody that you think is sort of type A personality or sort of holds on to their, you know, conscious mind a lot, and so many, boop, there they go. You know, you never, you never mm-hmm. know. Um, mm-hmm. So I haven't, I haven't been able to tell, you know, or even people that. You know, they they might be you know healers or you know spiritual practitioners of some sort, and you're thinking, well, they, you know, they might have the knowledge about the uh, the subject matter, and sometimes you know they're they're you know they need a little bit more time to get into it, and other times they just go right away. I just I didn't find any professions or types of people where I can say, okay, this one's going to go for sure, and this one's going to you know right. take a little bit of work. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, but, always a surprise, isn't it? <laughs> It's always a surprise, exactly. So you never know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how about, you know, um, why don't we end with this? Uh, have you found your sessions have changed since since beginning to practice this method? Gosh, if I've been doing this for about seven and a half years, you've been doing it for about nine and a half or almost ten years, that's, that's amazing. Um, how have they changed in that time for you, if they have at all? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, they have changed in that my my faith and confidence in the method has grown, you know, so much. So um, I'm able to handle you know, more challenging. Mm-hmm cases so to say you know in the past Mm -hmm. when you know when I first started people would say oh I'm not under you know I would believe them and just like you know abort mission sort of but now (laughs) she's like oh you know what else is new you know let's keep going (laughs) and then you know I throw some of the tools at them and then boom there we are you know the past lifetime Uh Um, Uh but in terms of like subject matter I'm trying to think um 
Hmm. I guess more people that are um, like straight from source um, or, you know, that haven't been in earth bodies before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a few yeah, of those. Okay. I think, I think yeah. you make a really great point, though. What, you know, when, when people first take Dolores's class, of course, when you're new at anything, you, you know, you gain skills and you gain confidence. But what, what your own was talking about there really makes so much sense about after doing this for a time and then really trusting in Dolores's method, you find that she's given us the tools that to, to handle just about everything and just about anything. And if you, yeah. if you just, um, you know, if, if you as a practitioner really believe that and, and it becomes easier and easier to believe the, the more you do this, almost anything that happens in a session it, and sometimes there can be just, you know, crazy things. I mean, I've seen actually like, you know, I've seen people, I've seen glows come off of people's body, you know, light. Uh, I've seen flashes of light in rooms and orbs floating around and, and windows wow. and doors yes. closing. And, and um, one of the coolest things that happened just, and I don't even think we said anything about this, but uh, dear Michelle Walling, who came here for a session and she actually talked about it um, on her Thanksgiving show. So, um, so she was fine talking about it, but I don't think we re- remembered to tell the audience about this one. So I was just getting her place ready uh, mm-hmm. to, to do this session, you know, with uh, we, we use normally we use real mattress beds. Um, some people use um, padded uh, tables and stuff, but I'm getting this, the, the bed ready for her and I'm spreading a sheet out and, and um, I kind of just took the sheet and kind of, you know, flipped it and, and I'm, I'm smoothing it out for her, for her to lay down. And after I do that and she's getting ready to get in bed, down from the ceiling, high above us, comes this little tiny feather and lands right on the pillow, right in the middle of the pillow. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so good. Yes, and I've I've had lots of feathers show up at, in the doorstep and sometimes on the table or in the floor, you know, in the in the studio. But I've never ever had that happen before, where I'm getting, you know, I'm getting the bed ready and I'm just smoothing out the pillow and just just like in kind of in Forrest Gump, you know, when that feather kind of flies in. And That's it comes beautiful. Out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and she had That's an so amazing beautiful. session. It, it was really, it was really wonderful. Yeah, I, I really, well, I, I mean, to... I enjoyed. Oh. Go, ahead. Go ahead. What did you say? Oh, I said I really, I mean, for me, you know, because I, as as a kid, I was always looking for an experience of spirit of of, you know, the unseen world, and I feel like right now, you know, this is the closest I'm getting, like, um, you know, of sort of these other realms of existence, and and you know. Being some other planets, as you know, like we also get to talk to, you know, ascended masters and alien beings, and it's just mm-hmm. a wonderful for me experience to, to have, yeah, to have an actual experience of these other worlds. I, I'm really, you know, that's a big part of why I enjoy these sessions so much. Mm-hmm. They really are enjoyable, and they can be a lot of fun for clients, and they can be profound, and they can be. Um, you know, confirmations of things they they already know, and they can be incredibly healing, and just so many, so many things. I I I so love this work, and um, and I I love having relationships with other practitioners and colleagues like you. We've been friends for a long time from afar. You ever think you'll pass through and and stop by and see me here in Kansas? <laughs> I would love to. I mean, on my list of things to do in the States is to do a, you know, a cross country road trip. So I'm, I'll, if I, when I do the one, I'll, I'll make sure I stop by. Give me a big hug. Okay. Well, you can't, you can't miss us. We're right in the middle of the country. Usually we're right. called like the flyover land, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, this has been so much fun. I always have so much fun talking with you and anybody in the California or the Los Angeles area. You'd be in great hands to see your own for a session, either his group sessions or or visit him 
to have a, a one-on-one QHHT session and, and you wouldn't regret it at all. Please tell us how everyone can find you, your own. All right, so I'm in Northeast Los Angeles. I have my studio in Eagle Rock. It's between Glendale and Pasadena. I also do out calls in the area. Um, and my website is uh, Source Energy Therapy. It's hyphenated. You can find it on the uh, website of Block Talk Radio. Um, my phone number is 323-439-3494. Um, what else can I tell people? Um, my Facebook page is also Source Energy Therapy. Mm, my email is my first name, sure. J, J is in John, E-R-O-E, and is in Nancy, the number seven, the number one, at gmail.com. Okay. All right. Well, this me. has been a pleasure. This has been a pleasure. And do keep us posted about Kathy and her book, will you? Of course, of course, of course, yes. So thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you for being the wonderful friend that you are and doing this important work, you know, having the radio show and having people find out about thank this wonderful you. material. Thank you as well. Well, we'll be in touch, and I'll see you on the forum. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I think it's been a really interesting show. I I really, quite frankly, I don't believe I've heard of any other case that's had so much evidence uh, to back it up. So it, it was really great to hear about that, about that today. So once again, you can find out more about me and my practice by going to NewEarthJourney.com. I also have another little radio show every other Tuesday night on BBS Radio, and it's called New Earth Journey. And let's see. um, I do want to mention that I'm going to be taking the next few Fridays off and spend Christmas with my family. And so we'll be talking to you again then in 2016. And as I leave you all this evening, I'm going to play the beautiful Latita Teresa's flute music again as we close the show. And you can find her music at latitateresa.com. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And good night.